Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming in on a Sunday morning. Uh, we've had we had a day for healthcare professionals yesterday, and uh, and then we had and I did the grand rounds at the Toronto General Hospital. So the last three two days have been amazing, meeting people who treat EDS and have EDS, and I have to say it's been a great experience. So my. My talk is a pretty lengthy talk, and uh, I think it's being recorded, right, Tom? It's been, so it's being recorded. So don't worry about taking notes. Just try to get get the few get to understand it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip the first few slides because those are disclosures. I don't have any dis financial disclosures. Uh, no one's paying me. I'm not paying anyone. Uh, <clears throat> so moving on to the meat of the matter, uh, can. I, Connecting the dots. This is what the talk is about, is connecting the dots. And uh, it's connecting between all the symptoms. You have to understand EDS is not one condition. It's a mix of uh, multiple conditions. And how does one condition feed into another condition? And how does it affect it? So I can't just say, oh, listen, you've just got POTS, and I'm just going to treat your POTS. But because there are other things that need to be treated at the same time. Um, so these are the conditions that EDS comes along with, uh, joint instability, POTS, tethered cord syndrome, mast cell activation syndrome, abdominal pain, carry malformation, autoimmune dysfunction, cr cranial cervical instability. And my job, and actually Dr. Maxwell's job also, the, the two of us are going to sort of explain to you how each one of these uh, feed into another one and how it's, how it's critically important that this all should make sense. <clears throat> so the first thing about pain is to treat what's broken. That's the basic principle about pain management is find out what's broken, fix it, and that's the only way you can treat pain. Everything else is a Band-Aid. <clears throat> so uh, for example, if someone has pain from the shoulder joint, it could be many reasons. It could be a dislocated shoulder joint. It could be muscle spasms. It could be a nerve that's getting pinched. Uh, or it could be all of them. And so in this case, the treatment of this shoulder pain would involve either one of these or all of these. <clears throat> uh, same thing on treatment. And in terms of treatment, you have to use a mix of treatments. So if, for example, if someone has pain from knee instability, uh, you might want to stabilize the knee first with braces and then strengthen the muscles around the knee and then try medications and try physical therapy, try different different options to stabilize the knee. And that's the treatment. So don't, I, what I'm trying to say is don't expect one magical treatment to fix everything. <clears throat> so this is what I call as the NC10 rule. The NC10 rule means that if you can find 10% relief from one treatment, and then you add another second treatment and you get another 10%, so you've got 20%, third one, 30%, and so forth, uh, if you get five of these, you get 50% relief. And all we're looking for is 10% from one modality. For example, if you take, let's say, acetaminophen, paracetamol, if you take that, you get 10% relief. You do physical therapy, you get 10% relief, and so on. You put the braces on 10%, so you got 30% right there. And that's the goal over here, is to use a little bit of each. Now, patients with EDS have many reasons to have pain. Um, Loose joints can hurt. We know that. And then muscles, what happens is when a, loose, when a joint is loose, then the muscles around the joint kind of tighten up. Classical example, shoulder. If your shoulder joint is loose, then the muscles around the shoulder joint lose, uh, tighten up. And then a loose joint can pinch nerves. And I'll show you an example. And then on top of that, you have the king of all conditions, mast cell activation syndrome, which causes inflammation of the joints and muscles. And then you have POTS or dysautonomia, which uh, adds to the loss of function. <clears throat> so this is what I'm trying to say is each one of these have to be looked at separately. So, but one thing that I just want to stress is joint surgery to help pain results in worsening the condition. Now, just to clarify, uh, joint pain. So if somebody has a lax joint and if you, bless you, if you go ahead and if you want to, if, the, if you go ahead and get surgery to tighten up the joint, it's actually going to be counterproductive. 
And so joint surgery to help pain actually worsens it. And there's plenty of studies to prove that. So I thought that the best way to talk about EDS and pain is to go region by region. So I don't miss anything. And that's how I also see my patients. <clears throat> so let's start from the top, headaches. Um, one of the, and this is a small list which I've picked up. This is actually I counted the total number of reasons. There are 25 reasons to have headaches. And I, I've left out the rare ones. I've left out the really common ones. But carry malformation is one of them. Cervicogenic headaches, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, POTS, mm -hmm. spontaneous CSF leak, where the pressure inside the brain drops, craniocervical instability, where there's instability of the neck and head, and then you have raised pressure inside the head, also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. <clears throat> and I'll quickly, briefly touch on each one of them to explain to you what it means. So if someone comes in and says, my whole, can you still hear me? Can I move away? Oh. My whole head hurts and I see double, I can feel my heartbeat in my ears. So you can hear throbbing in your ears and your, it's an intense pain in your head. This is usually a sign of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. That means the pressure inside the head is high. These patients usually present with vision issues. They have sensitivity to light, they have double vision. Um, one of the key features is that they have a pulsatile tinnitus, which means the ringing in their ears matches their heartbeat. Uh, now, oftentimes it is because of a narrowing of a blood vessel inside the brain. The, one of the venous sinuses is narrowed down, which increases the pressure inside the brain. Uh, the diagnosis, this is the hard part. The diagnosis is, uh, the, for commonly they do a spinal tap. And I don't really like doing a spinal tap in these patients is because of a couple of reasons. One, the dura matter, the spinal, spinal tap is always complicated by post-dural puncture headache, which means they continue to leak CSF through that hole that was made to look at the pressure. Also, uh, what most medical centers have found is that the CSF pressure values in EDS are not the same range in, as in non-EDS patients. And the reason, the, the, way, the way we found this out was um, there were patients who were getting a spinal tap to look at their pressure inside the CSF and their headaches got better, but the CSF pressure was normal and it didn't quite make sense. And so now we've come to think that maybe the normal range of CSF pressure in EDS is different from non-EDSs. Um, I exam, um, I don't, I, I definitely get an eye exam, no question about that, but don't wait for eye exam changes because that's, that's kind of irreversible. So oftentimes I've had a couple of, a couple of times I've had physicians come back and say, well, we had a look at the eyes and there was no change in the optic disc. Right, you don't want to wait for that. You don't want for eye changes to happen in order to start treating the intracranial hypertension. So an MR venography is the best way. So they shoot some dye into your vein and look at the distribution, how the blood flows inside the brain, and that gives them an idea of what ha what's happening. And it's usually because of venous stenosis, which means there's a narrowing of one of the sinuses in the head. Uh, the treatment, if there is a narrowing, the treatment is usually a stent. Uh, there are medicines that can be used uh, Personal experience, I, we haven't found great results from it. Uh, the best way to do it is, again, remember the philosophy, what, treat what's broken. If there is a narrowing in the sinus, nothing is going to work other than opening up the sinus. I, I don't mean these sinuses, I mean the, I mean the veins inside the head. <clears throat> uh, and then of course, a shunt to drain any excess fluid. So if, Someone comes and says, my headache gets worse when I stand and it almost goes away when I lie down. So when you stand, the headache comes on instantly and the minute you lie down, the headache goes away or almost goes away. It's usually a sign of spontaneous CSF leak. So the CSF is the fluid in which the brain and the spinal cord are floating. So this is a closed compartment. See this blue stuff is a CSF. So the brain and the spinal cord float in this fluid. It's a closed compartment. Now, if there's a hole in the compartment, if there's a leak in here, anywhere in the, there's a leak, then what happens is the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, the brain drops. When the brain drops, it causes pain, causes headaches. And that's a called spontaneous CSF leak. 
Um, it can happen in two conditions, two circumstances in EDS. One, if they've had a, an epidural or a spinal tap for some reason, whatever reason they've had a spinal tap or an epidural, that can cause a CSF leak. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to fix that. Daylight time ends today. <laughs> All right, <laughs> got that. <laughs> um, and the other reason is that they have a CSF leak for unknown reasons, we don't know. And there are all kinds of theories out there. Uh, maybe the dura mater is thin, there's this weakness in some part of the CSF somewhere. They had a big coughing bout, got a puncture, we don't know. So they can have spontaneous CSF leak. <clears throat> and they usually present with headaches that get worse when they stand up. And then it's more than, uh, to me, when I ask patients, I ask them like, does the headache get better than 50, more than 50% when you lie down? Most headaches get better when you lie down. I mean, whatever the headache is, once you lie down, close your eyes, it feels better. But in this case, the difference is very remarkable. So almost 100% relief, actually. In chronic CSF leaks, where the leak is very small and they've had it for years, the headache usually gets worse by the end of the day. It's a severe headache that lasts all day long. Um, this, it may be associated with nausea and vomiting. Um, actually, a lot of nausea and vomiting. And then again, they have ringing in their ears, but it's not a pulsatile ringing. So that's the difference from raised intracranial pressure. <clears throat> so one of the other conditions that causes headaches when you stand up is POTS or dysautonomia. And I just, this is a small table and I've just highlighted the important stuff. So um, in CS, this is the CSF leak, this is POTS. Um, in, in CSF leaks, the headaches get better when you lie down. In POTS, there's not a significant change. The orthostatics, which is your blood pressure and your heart rate changes in CSF leak don't change remarkably, but in POTS, they obviously change remarkably. The heart rate goes up with no change in the blood pressure. POTS is obviously associated with dizziness. CSF leak is not associated with dizziness, and that's how we differentiate between that. <clears throat> So uh, how do you manage CSF leak headaches? Uh, you increase uh, fluids, uh, oral fluids, you drink a lot of fluids, you take a lot of caffeine, caffeine pills, coffee, tea, whatever. Uh, they even give you IV caffeine, uh, abdominal binder, so you wear a corset, which kind of increases the pressure in the CSF. Um, if all else fails, they do a high volume epidural blood patch. And most times people with EDS need multiple patches. It takes a few tries. It takes a few times to do that. So they'll get a patch, it gets better, it comes back, they do it again. If all that doesn't work out, then they do a directed epidural fibrin glue. So it's basically kind of a super glue they inject into there and it closes, um, it, it helps with the CSF pressure. Now, patients who've had spine surgery and wind up with CSF leak, they'll go back and do a repair. They actually do a dural flap and repair it. So um, the other type of headache I want to talk to you about was my headache gets worse when I cough and I have tingling in my hands and feet. There's paresthesias in my hands and feet and I have difficulty swallowing. It feels like I'm choking on food. This is um, carry malformation. And so, like my zebra, huh? yeah. this, is a, this is a new one I've just started adding. Um, so just to explain to you what carry malformation is, Carry malformation, so this is the normal brain. Uh, and this, this thing that looks like a cauliflower is called the cerebellum. It's responsible for balance. And there's a hole over here through which the, the brain comes out and becomes a spinal cord. It's called foramen magnum. It's a pretty big hole. And this is called the brain stem, which really controls a lot of important functions in the body. In carry malformation, for some reason, so this is the part of the skull that's around the cerebellum. This, there's some sort of a deformity or some sort of a narrowing or shallowness for various re reasons, I'm sorry. The, the, the brain gets pushed down, so the cerebellum gets pushed down and everything gets pushed down a little bit. It gets squeezed through this foramen magnum here. And when it gets squeezed, so it becomes really tight in there. And when it becomes tight, the, this part of the cerebellum squeezes through the foramen magnum. It's called the tonsils. The, the tonsils get squeezed and the brainstem gets squeezed. So these patients present with, the, the hallmark sign is half time? Oh, half time for the, 
Oh, okay, sorry. Um, headaches get worse with coughing or straining. So if they cough or strain, the headaches get worse because there's a pressure inside. See, when they have carry malformation, the CSF flow around this part is also blocked. And so the pressure increases. So they do have uh, headaches get worse with coughing. The headaches are usually in the back of the head. Uh, and then they have some non-specific symptoms like neck pain, balance problems, dizziness, difficulty swallowing. Um, so these are some of the issues with carry malformation. So how do you diagnose carry malformation? Um, the, of course, a good history and a physical exam is the best way to do it. The other way is to get an MRI of the neck. And here's the problem we run into is you need an upright MRI of the neck. Of the, of the neck. And that's because uh, one of the things that happens in, in, in ADS is there's a, what's called a cranial settling, which means that the ligaments of the neck are loose. So when I stand up, the weight of my head pushes down, my ligaments become loose and lax, and so there's a cranial settling, and that's when carry malformation manifests itself. Um, <clears throat> getting to an upright MRI is a whole different story. Uh, and this, I just want to show you real quickly what happens. So this is, this is a patient with a MRI while lying down, and this is where, you remember the cauliflower I showed you? That's the cerebellum, uh, and that's the brain stem, that's the foramen magnum, and everything looks nice and, nice and quiet. Um, when this patient stands up, the cerebellum gets pushed down into the foramen magnum, and that's where the problem starts. So this is a sitting MRI, whereas this is a lying down MRI. And then I'll mention a little bit about the angles that, that neuroradiologists like to look at is called the cliboaxial angle. In this case, it's normal. In this case, it's not normal. And that's one of the reasons why we need it. Now, um, so the herniation, the problem with herniation of the brain is that um, it causes obstruction to the CSF flow, and that causes an increase in pressure. But studies have also shown that patients who carry malformation are, can also have tethered cord syndrome at the same time. And um, actually the figure is about 66%. 66% of patients that have carry malformation can have tethered cord syndrome at the same time. Um, and it's also associated with craniocervical instability. In fact, neurosurgeons who do treat this in cases of EDS will always do a carry, they, call, they, they do a decompression. And along with the decompression, they also do a little fusion here. Oh, this one? Yeah. This mouse? Okay. Oh, the online people can see it? Online people can see it when you use the mouse. Oh, really? Okay. So, um, sorry, online people. Uh, so just to recap, my headache gets worse when I cough. I have tingling in my hands and feet, and I have difficulty swallowing as carry malformation. Uh, neck pain. So moving on to neck pain, uh, <clears throat> my head feels too heavy to hold up. And this is a really very common problem that we get is um, they'll complain like, I really, my head feels so heavy that I need to like take it and leave it on the side. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this is usually because of craniocervical instability. Now, remember the spine is made of a ton of ligaments and it's just these ligaments that hold up our spine. And in EDS, the problem is that these ligaments are very lax. They are loose and lax. And so when you have lax ligaments, the spine is not as stable anymore. And on top of that, you have a head that weighs approximately, well, 10 pounds, that's about two and a half kilograms. So it weighs about two and a half kilograms. And so with that kind of head weighing on top of your head, it's hard for the spine, the neck to hold up. Just to show you an example, uh, <clears throat> This one, so this picture over here, the first one is um, somebody in a very neutral position, which means the ears are in line with your, with, your, with your shoulders, and that's the neutral position. And the weight of the head is, oh, the microphone fell off. Um, sorry about that. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so in the neutral position, the head weighs about four and a half kilograms. 
But if you move your head forward by just two and a half centimeters, then it, the weight almost doubles. The pressure of the head on the neck doubles. And then if you move it by five centimeters, it, it becomes three times almost, 13 kilograms. That's a lot of head weighing on a neck with loose ligaments. And that's where the problem comes in with craniocervical instability. Um, so what do patients with craniocervical instability present with? They present with neck pain, stiffness, and of course, headaches, dizziness, tingling to their face, and some non-specific complaints like fatigue, poor sleep, nausea. The stiffness, um, which kind of sounds counterintuitive because you're talking about laxity and now you're talking about stiffness, is because what happens is that the muscles around the neck, when, like, remember I told you when the ligaments are loose, then the muscles around that area start to tighten up. And so it's these muscles that tighten up in the neck and you feel that muscle stiffness there. Now, all of these conditions can overlap with other conditions. This is a uh, quick MRI, I uh, just wanted to show you. You can see this is, you're looking at somebody's head and neck from the side. And here's the, here's the same, remember the cauliflower I showed you, the cerebellum, here's the brainstem. And here you can see how it's getting pinched. Um, so this person has craniocervical instability. And this is one of the angles that they measure and the angle is not right over here, of course. And <clears throat> so these are some of the things that can be seen on an upright MRI. Uh, and these are the angles. So it's not just eyeballing and saying, hey, listen, I think you've got craniosurgical insulin. It's about very specific angles that they measure. This one in particular is called the grab mapstone oaks measurement. Um, so how do I go back? Oh, okay, let me use it. <coughs> Excuse me. Over here, you see what's happening is that, so this is the brainstem, and this is the front of the brainstem. This is the back of the brainstem. And in this case, what you see is the front of the brainstem is getting pinched. And that is called ventral brainstem compression. It's part of a condition called cervical medullary syndrome. These patients present with vision changes, dizziness, speech changes, they have difficulty swallowing, they have symptoms of POTS and dysautonomia. So Dr. Maxwell is gonna talk a lot more about dysautonomia and POTS, and he's gonna show you all these things uh, playing in, how they all play into each other. Um, so how do you, how do you uh, take pictures in a patient with instability? Now, cr craniocervical instability is a dynamic issue. The neck isn't moving well, but if you take a picture of somebody just standing still or sitting still or lying down still, you won't know what's moving. So we need, we need dynamic pictures. Digital motion x-ray called DMX is a straightforward x-ray in which the patient moves their head and neck uh, back and forth, side to side, and then they can see how the vertebra move on top of each other, how the head, the skull moves on top of each other. Um, there's also, um, actually you'd have a speaker today who will talk about some of this di digital motion X-ray today. Um, and then you can do a functional CT scan where they, where they, take, your, where they, take, they take pictures of your head and neck in different angles. Now these, I don't want you to, this, I put in these fancy sounding uh, ex, uh, angles and measurements, but these are more for asking the, neuro, the neuroradiologist to, when you get the pictures, if they can measure these angles. And if you can get these measurements, it really helps understand what's going on. So there are three basic angles that they look at measurements. The first one is called the clivoaxial angle. This, the second one is called the Harris measurement. Uh, and this is the grab mapstone oaks measurement. And sometimes the neuroradiologists do it, and sometimes neurosurgeons prefer to do their own. And so it's not a special way of taking a, a MRIs, it's just that they, when they have the MRI, they just draw these lines on a computer and look at them. Um, so how do you treat craniocervical instability? Um, you start, the first, of course, if it's mild to moderate, start with strengthening exercises, because the more you strengthen your muscles in the neck, the more stability you, you can get. Um, you can use a hard cervical collar, especially on days when you really feel you're, you, you really feel the symptoms of craniocervical instability. And then of course, in severe cases, uh, the only option left is a surgical fusion. This is an example of a cervical stabilizing collar that I like. It's called the Vista Multipost Therapy Collar. One of the advantages of this one is that it has a balloon inside. 
which you can inflate. There's a little button here. You press that. This is a tube. It inflates it. So it sort of adjusts to your position of your head and neck. This is another one that's very popular among neurosurgeons. It's called the Miami J cervical collar. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a preference between surgeons and physicians who treat, you, treat it. Now, if you do have mild to moderate, uh, mild, even mild craniocervical instability, I would recommend wearing it in conditions where you're likely, say for example, you're gonna be in a car as a passenger, wear it because you don't want, even a little fender bender can be harmful. So I would recommend using it then, obviously not when you're driving, but as a passenger. The next one is temporomandibular joint pain. And this is this joint over here. This is an inherently unstable joint, the temporomandibular joint. The reason is that we need our jaws to open up, open up and down, and then also side to side so we can chew. And that's the problem we have, is that people with temporomandibular joint, dis and this is common just not in EDS. It's also common in non-EDS patients. But in EDS patients, it's just another one thing that adds to everything else. Uh, they often present with pain around, I keep clicking the mouse. Um, it, it's pain around the head, uh, in the jaw. It's more facial pain and a lot of headaches. These people have a lot of headaches. It can even translate into the neck and upper back. They complain of clicking noises when they open their mouth. Uh, they have a history for clenching and grinding. They have pain with chewing. And sometimes they even sublux their, well, they often sublux their joint. It gets stuck and then they just put it back in. Um, so as I'm talking about TMJ, I just want to really touch quickly on dental issues in EDS. There are lots and lots of dental issues because it's connective tissue. Your teeth are connective tissue, your gums are connective tissue, and there's wear and tear of the gums all the time. Anytime you eat something, there's wear and tear. And of the, because enamel is thin in these patients, in, in EDS, it starts to wear out quickly. And in fact, it, some, some dentists even call it soft teeth. So they are prone to having dental cavities very easily. They have gum recession, they have pocketing over there, and they have, and of course, because the gums are not stable, the gums aren't healthy, they start having unstable teeth. There's a very high incidence of gingivitis in this case uh, because they have this pocketing. And this increases inflammatory reactions of the body. They are prone to having higher incidence of diabetes and arthritis. <clears throat> um, of the many, many toothpastes that I've found in the market, most of them are, in fact, all of them are abrasive. So they sort of scrape off your teeth and that's how they work. This is the one brand that I found which doesn't scrape off. It works as a chelating agent, which means that it sort of grabs everything off the gums. It grabs everything off the, off the teeth. And so it helps in better healing of the gums. <clears throat> and of course, it's gluten-free, sugar-free. Um, local anesthetics, numbing medicines. We all know that numbing medicines don't work in most EDS patients. They'll, they need more or sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, and sometimes in rare cases, it does the opposite. When you give it to them, it lasts for days and days. Um, there's not much good literature on it, and they, but they're right now there are two studies that they're doing on to figure out what's the reason. One of the papers that I came across was on using carbocaine, a local anesthetic called carbocaine or mepivacin that works well in EDS. Uh, the other one you can try, another cousin to mepivacin is called bupivacin. It's commonly available, so you don't, the dentist doesn't have to go out of their way to get it. Uh, so they can use bupivacin. Do we, do we break now? Yeah, let's just break now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Pridmore. I'm speaking later this afternoon, but I've been asked to do some movement breaks for everybody. Give everyone an opportunity to stand if you need to or move. I'm going to lead you through a couple little movements and exercises um, if you'd like to participate. So I'm going to have you just move your chairs back so you have some room in front of you. So for your hips and legs, and we'll just start. Um, you can stand or you can sit. So it really is for who, whatever level of comfort you have. 
I'll try to have the microphone so you can hear me. So I just would like you to just gently stand up on your toes and then drop down. So just to get the calf muscles engaging. If you're laying down, so those in the comfort room and who are just pointing and flexing, or even if you're sitting there in your chair and you just want to gently do some pedal pumping, moving the feet, we can have you also just do it one at a time. So raising up onto one foot and then alternating through to the other. Having some place of contact, so whether you're holding onto the chair or using the table in front for balance and support. Then let's just open up our mid back, give ourselves a gentle hug, and just visualize bringing your head back and onto your spine. So, again, as Dr. Shopper has been mentioning about the heaviness, it's not that you have to force, but just try to visualize that your head comes back to sit on top of your spine and take some breath into the back. So, visualizing opening between the Shoulder blades breathing down into the bottom ribs, even seeing if you can get the breath traveling down a little bit lower. And then you can gently release and you can even bring hands just behind your hips and open up into your chest here. Again, this can be another factor that helps to really pull our head forward, pull our shoulders forward is how tight we tend to get in the front of our body. So take an opportunity here to breathe into the front of the body here as well. Right. Another place of support for those that have that heavy head feeling is to bring hands behind your head and really help to hold the head. So whether you're again sitting in your chair standing or even laying on the floor, just to be able to hear now combine both where you're opening up the chest and breathing in, but just feeling like you can let your head rest a little bit into the hands. So a few little places I'm going to get to talk to you more as we do some more movement breaks about breathing and uh, and also further in my presentation. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was that was really nice. Okay, so <laughs> moving on to our um, the next thing I want to talk to you about was tethered cord syndrome, and. This again, we're, we're still moving down from the head down to the to the feet, and so tethered cord syndrome is, uh, and I wanted to show you what tethered cord syndrome is. This is a this is this is the normal spine on this side, and this is the one with the tethered cord, and over here you can see. That the, that the spine kind of ends at the level of L1, and after that, it's just a piece of um, thread called the phylum that hangs down over here. It actually hangs down loosely. Um, in tethered cord, what happens is this phylum is, isn't hanging down anymore loosely. It's kind of it's attached, it's stuck over here. And what happens is when it's stuck, it pulls down the spinal cord. So now instead of being at L1, it's now at L3, it's a little lower. And then at the same time, over at the same time, it this becomes second, this fatty deposition there. In fact, now we're starting to see we're starting to see some inflammation in this phylum. And so this is the problem. So when this gets pulled, when the whole spinal cord gets pulled, then you get these symptoms of diffuse body weight pain. It's actually there are no this is the problem because of because the spinal cord gets pulled, we not the symptoms vary from patient to patient. And so this is what is called tethered cord syndrome. They have, they present with low back pain, they have neurogenic bladder, they have weakness to their legs, and they actually have a diffuse pain to the leg. It's like they have, they have Charlie like, Charlie has horse-like pain. It's like a muscle spasms that come into their calf muscles. Um, they may do toe walking or may have a history of toe walking or heel walking. Um, <clears throat> Now, so what is a neurogenic bladder? A neurogenic bladder is when someone, they go often and they can, I mean, they go multiple times during the day, multiple times during the night. Uh, they have a sense of urgency, can't hold, got to go. And then again, they have this feeling that once they finish peeing, they're not quite sure they've really emptied their bladder. And so it's like, should I stay on? Should I come back? And it's just this, this weird feeling of not having to empty, having that they, they've emptied their bladder fully. Um, they may or may not have incontinence. I don't see incontinence too often, but they can have incontinence. Now, it's not, 
the incontinence that I'm talking to urine is not just a simple leakage with coughing or laughing. It's much more than that. So uh, the treatment here is, of course, uh, you get the neurosurgeon who goes in there and kind of clips off this little uh, phylum over here, loosens it up, and so the spinal cord stretches back. So I'm going to talk to you about pain in the chest wall, pain from ribs in EDS. And I think almost every EDS patient that I have seen has pain from ribs. They also have a sense of what is called air hunger. It's like they haven't taken a breath and so they sigh a lot, which is, which is a little annoying for the people around them because it seems like they're just tired and fed up. Um, it's called air hunger. Uh, they have pain from ribs, so their ribs are super tender. Um, and obviously, their heart and lungs are normal. There's nothing wrong there. Um, just, a quick quest, just a quick piece of information. Each rib makes three, junk, three joints. It connects to the spine in the back with three joints. And so like all joints, these joints are also loose and can be lax. So in this case, they have, uh, so you have this, uh, so this is inspiration, this is expiration. So this patient is breathing in, breathing out. So we talk about joint position sense later on. In joint position sense, patients with EDS lose this sensation. They don't have any, uh, their brain quite, can't quite get their position, their, their, figure out the position of their joints. And it's the same thing with ribs. The ribs, when, they, when you breathe in, you breathe, your ribs move up and they all have to move up together. And the diaphragm has to move down at the same time. And so, so this is the problem. So when you breathe in, breathe out, the ribs all have to move up and down. And because the brain isn't getting a signal from the ribs as to where the ribs are at any given time, the ribs have an uncoordinated movement. So some ribs are moving faster than other ribs. And what happens is, as a result of that, these muscles between the ribs, these little muscles between the ribs get overstretched. And when they get overstretched, they go into a spasm and they become painful. So they have pain from ribs. They can have pain from subluxing ribs in the back. Um, and they have this sense of not getting a breath in deep enough. And this is all from what is called loss of proprioception. But there's a muscle in the back, in the lower back, called the chordatus lumborum, QL muscle. It's not a muscle for the lower back. It doesn't support the back, but it's a muscle for breathing. It's right over here. And this muscle goes into a spasm also because it's part of the muscle for breathing. And so these patients also have lower back pain. So the question is, if I can, if I can somehow help patients with EDS in terms of their breathing, their rib problems, I might be able to also help their lower back pain. And so there are some exercises you can do. One of them is uh, lie on your back um, with your, place a book on the belly button. And uh, this picture isn't quite correct. They sh you should have a, your, your knees should be bent. You lie on your back, uh, put a book on your belly button and breathe in and breathe out. So you move the book up and down for 20 minutes. If you can do it twice a day, that'd be great. If not, just once a day, that's great. And this can help basically help with proprioception of the ribs. It can help your back pain and it can help you breathe better. The other one you can do is singing in high notes and low notes. So you go high, you go low, you go high, you go low. So you're trying to get, to get your ribs to exercise. Uh, wind instruments like a flute or a recorder is a good way to go. And again, poor proprioception. So, We'll talk about proprioception later on, but a compression shirt, something that's a little skin tight for the chest is very, very helpful in these cases. So I'm gonna move on to pain in the arms in EDS. There are two reasons, there, well, there are a bunch of reasons why somebody would have shoulder pain. One of them is laxity of the shoulder joint. So like I told you, the TM joint is a loose joint inherently. The other joint that's very unstable is the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint subluxes very easily. And then when that subluxes or becomes loose, then the rotator cuff, the muscles that go around the shoulder joint, tighten up. And that's the other reason why patients have shoulder pain in EDS. It's not as much as a joint subluxing, it's as much as the muscle trying to pull the joint back in. And the other reason why these patients have, have pain is called thoracic outlet syndrome. 
This is thoracic outlet syndrome. Patients present with this kind of pain. They have pain between their shoulder blades. They have pain going down the arm and into very specific fingers. This is, it looks a lot like pain coming from the disc in the spine, from the neck. What happens in this, this case is, uh, this is a little confusing picture. Let me show you. This is the first rib. And this is the collarbone over here. Between the collarbone and the first rib, there's a gap. So that's over here. We're talking about this area. And between this gap, there is a neurovascular vascular bundle, which is nerves, veins, and arteries that go down the arm. So between my shoulder, between my first rib and my collarbone, there's nerves, veins, and arteries that travel down my arm. If the shoulder joint is loose and lax, then what happens is this gap closes down. The clavicle, the collarbone presses down and it squeezes the nerve or the vein or the artery. And so these patients develop pain going down the arm. The other reason they develop this pain, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome is, there's a muscle in the front called the pec muscle, pectoralis minor. This muscle also goes into a spasm because it's trying to support this shoulder joint. It's trying to support this loose shoulder joint. And so the pec minor goes into a spasm and that also squeezes these nerves vessels going down the arm. <clears throat> And that is called thoracic outlet syndrome. The test for this is really simple. There are a bunch of tests. A physician can do them in the office, clinically, while doing an exam. They can do that. They're called AdSense tests, health state tests. It's very basic tests. They can do them in the office. You don't need fancy testing for, uh, MRIs for it. Um, <clears throat> the treatment for thoracic outlet syndrome is the first one is you try kinesio taping. So you're trying to sort of help the shoulder joint be a little more stable, help the muscles around that area. If that doesn't work, then they, what they do is they inject Botox into this pectoralis minor muscle. They inject Botox into the scalene muscle here to sort of loosen these muscles up so there's a little bit more gap. And then if that doesn't work out, then it's excision of the first rib. So they remove that first rib. So when they remove this rib, when they remove the first rib, it increases the gap. And that's the other way they can treat it. It's not a fun surgery. It's not something that we like to do. But the good news is that about 70% patients respond to the Botox part of it itself. The, the, the question here is getting that diagnosis. So you really need to get this diagnosis from someone who's very familiar with it. Usually physiatrists, uh, thoracic surgeons uh, will be able to able to diagnose this pretty easily. If you, and of course, you knowing this helps a lot. Educating yourself about your own body is the key over here. And so like, okay, I have this uh, pain going down my arm. I've been told it's because of this, it's because of that. But is there, is there a possibility I could have thoracic outlet syndrome? Personal experience, um, it's a very, very high incidence of thoracic outlet syndrome in ADS from my, my patient series. Now, not all of them are serious. They're, not all of them need surgery or need massive treatment, but it is there. And this is an example of kinesio taping. We, uh, they are going to talk, we're going to talk about it later on a lot. Um, now, this is a key thing that I want you to understand. It's called joint position sense of proprioception. This is the body's ability to understand movement. And th what happens here is that there are sensors in my joints, in my tendons, in my ligaments that inform my brain exactly where they are. For example, if I have an itch on my head, I can simply go in there and scratch that itch. I don't have to look at anything. I don't have to look in a mirror. I don't have to do anything. My brain knows exactly where my knuckles, my fingers, my thumb is, where my elbow is, and I can zero in on the itch. And that's called joint position sense. The problem with EDS is that they lose this joint position sense. And actually, they don't know it also. Um, it's, a, it's a feeling of not knowing where they are in space. They don't have that good sense of that. And that's especially when they walk, they, they feel like they don't have a great sense of where they are. And they compensate by actually looking at where they're stepping. And so this is called uh, joint positions of the proprioception. And I'll show you an example of where it help where it does affect the body. So what are proprioception exercises? How do you fix proprioception? One of them is you do, um, and these exercises are all fun exercises. You do balance board, wobble board, you know the balance board and wobble board. Stork standing as you stand on one leg, 
with your eyes open, and then you do it with your eyes closed. A uh, stand-up paddleboard, um, I'm sure, I hope everyone knows what a stand-up paddleboard is. Sitting on an exercise ball or exercising in water. Exercising in water is key because what happens is water puts pressure on your body, and then that helps your brain figure out where your body is at any time. For those of you who don't know what a stand-up paddleboard is, I actually posed for this picture. <laughs> Just to be clear, uh, just to be clear, I'm the guy in the front, not the one in the back. Uh huh? Um, yeah. Anyway, but the other one is to see uh, compression garments. And so, so the brain is pretty smart. What it does is, once it knows that it can't get any message from the brain, so it, the brain then uses sensors on the skin over the joints. It uses that to get an idea of where your joints are. And it's, there, are, there are four different types of receptors on the skin. They are, they're called mechanoreceptors. There are four different types. Um, they all have fancy names. But these receptors on the skin then send a message. So the brain uses signals from the skin to figure out the joint position sense, which means wearing a compression garment would make all, all the sense. This is one particular company I like to use. It's called CW-X. The reason I like it is because they're not only compression. They uh, have these very pretty uh, markings on them. These are actually kind of a kinesio tape. So it reinforces the knee joint. It reinforces the hip joint. Uh, these are athletic wear. And so it's worth trying them. I have, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because this is practical feedback from patients with EDS that I've who have tried it and have given me feedback on it. So, um, and the same thing applies to other places and I'll show you. So the question is this joint position sense, is it, is it just particular to EDS? No, it's not. Toddlers don't have it because it's undeveloped. So they tend to, when they first learn how to walk, they fall a lot. The elderly lose it because of joint degeneration. Uh, and of course, point, after they've had joint surgery, they lose that. Athletes use it, lose it because of uh, joint trauma. And so you'll always see athletes like wearing tight clothes, like tight shirts, is because this is one of the reasons. Um, another example of this is uh, of poor joint position senses. So when people hold a pen, when you are supposed to hold a pen, you hold it just right. Not too tight, not too loose. That's how you hold it. People with EDS kind of wrap their fingers around it, white knuckle it, and you can see it over here. This, this lady is white knuckling it. She's using a bunch of fingers to hold a pen. And when they write, when they write, they press down really hard on paper, and that's called haptic feedback. So when you write on paper, you have this scratchy sensation when you write, and that scratchy sensation tells you how hard you're right, pressing down. They don't get that. So what they do is they really press down hard, they overcompensate. So on top of that, they have loose, lax finger joints. Mine aren't very lax, but uh, they have lax finger joints. It's like having jello fingers. So in other words, these, these, pe these people with EDS, what they're doing is they're holding a pen super tight. They're pressing down really hard. And so they're using a lot of energy to do something as simple as writing or holding a fork or holding a knife or brushing their hair. It takes up a lot of their energy and that's why a lot of these people have hand pain, especially the dominant hand. And again, the workaround is that, uh, this is where I get the best compliance is with uh, fingerless compression gloves. You, they're, they're called arthritis gloves. If you go on Amazon, you'll find them as arthritis gloves. Um, or for kids, you can use um, these, it's a tube made by a company called Ableware. It's a dense foam tube that you can put around a pen, toothbrush, forks, knives, and all of these can help. And of course, brace, braces for unstable joints. And these are the braces, these are called finger splints or ring splints, and in fact, there's a vendor out there um, who has some really neat finger splints. You can have a look at them. Uh, what happens is if they have a jello finger, it sort of stabilizes. So you know when you hold when you hold a pen or when you hold something, you have to stiffen your fingers. They have to be stiff. If they're soft, then you need a lot of energy to hold them. So the splints do help uh, stabilize them. It's not just subluxation of the joint. Even if your lack, even if your finger joints are lax, it helps. That helps in holding things. 
So that brings me to this topic about splinting and bracing. How important is that? So braces maintain our joints in a neutral position. So for example, if this is a knee joint and knee joints hyperextend a little bit, the normal knee joint hyperextends a little bit, it's called the locked position. Most patients with EDS will have a knee joint that looks like that. So what the brace does is it kind of brings it back into a more neutral position. It avoids hyperextension. And because a joint, because a, a brace covers a joint, it helps with proprioception. I recommend starting them gradually. Don't just jump onto it quickly and use them. Like, so when you get a brace, wear it for an hour or two for a day, then two hours, two or three hours for a day and so forth, increase it. And then as time goes by, start to decrease their use. <clears throat> The, the important question is, I get this feedback, I get this pushback is, oh, don't wear braces too long because they make your muscles weak. And the problem with that is it's not true. They do not make your muscles weak. It's a very common misconception. Braces, for example, for one, don't go around a muscle. And look at this brace around the ankle joint. It's around a bone. Same thing with a knee brace. It goes around the bone, the knee joint. It doesn't go around a muscle. So the muscle can still function. Plus, if, my, if I have a loose knee joint, and I, I'm not going to walk because it's going to hurt a lot, so I'll try to save that spoon and not walk as much. If I have a brace, then I can now walk better, so I'm using my muscles a lot better. And when I'm using my muscles a lot better, they become stronger. So the concept that braces make muscles wrong, weak is not correct. I think it came from the old times when, you know, when they put people with a fracture in a plaster cast, and then they took the cast off the muscle would have atrophied, which is understandable because they're trying to stop the movement of the muscles. So on the contrary, braces actually make muscles stronger. So moving on to legs. Um, in legs, when you come to the lower extremity, uh, look at the Look at the knees and ankles first. Uh, look at the, sorry, the ankles and feet first. If this is unstable, then that makes your knees unstable, which then makes your hip unstable, which then throws your spine off. So it's a, it's a Jenga tower over here. If you can stabilize this, it might help the knee, which might help this, which might help that. So let's go to the feet. This is an example of flat feet. The easiest way to look at flat feet is you just stand and you look at them from the side. And instead of seeing a little arch, you'll see a straight line. And the, the thing about flat feet in ADS is a little different. If this is a foot, when they step down, it flattens out. But it's actually the front of the foot that flattens out more. It spreads out more. So they're four feet, the front of the foot, the toes, are the area behind the toes, actually spreads out. And the reason I'm saying that is because when you're looking for shoes, you have to have a little wide shoes, allowing the, allowing the toes to spread out a little bit. Um, <clears throat> most, if it's not a very, um, it's not, if it's not a very severe flat foot, then most sneakers nowadays have an arch built into them. And they should, that should be enough. If it's a really bad flat foot, then of course you'll have to look at um, shoe inserts. One of the things about flat feet is that, that you see, see how this, if you, look at this, if you look at them from behind, you'll see how the ankle then turns out this way. And this is part of being having flat feet. They're called pronation of the ankle. And so this turns out this way. So what happens is the force that comes down the leg, as it comes down, it completely misses the ankle joint. And so this, this part of the foot has to hold up to a lot of extra weight or abnormal weight. And so stabilizing the foot is really important in this case. How do you strengthen muscles in your feet? Uh, barefoot walking um, is excellent. Most people with EDS I know, they like walking bare feet uh, because it sort of gives them that sense of proprioception. It gives them that joint position sense, the feedback. But, for, but on a different purpose, what happens is when you walk, you claw your feet, you claw your toes when we walk. And that helps strengthen the muscles in the feet. Uh, and then, of course, uh, tip rising, uh, repeated rising on tiptoes, that strengthens the muscle. Uh, ankle raises, that helps also strengthen your muscles in your feet and ankles. The, what kind of shoes should they wear? There's only one word for that, and that's sneakers. 
Sneakers are by far the best. And why? Because if this is your foot, this is your shoe, you want that shoe to grab your foot. That's the reason you want it. I mean, anything with Velcro or laces is fine, but it should grab your foot. And, if, and then if the, the midsole should be cushioned. And these are the one of the, sometimes, uh, you know, because most people with EDS uh, are girls, young girls, uh, they don't like wearing braces and they don't like wearing sneakers all the time. You can get away with um, ankle boots. Uh, ankle pe people, if, if it's not a very unstable joint, they like wearing an ankle boot and that does the job also. This is a company that I like. It's a German company that makes shoe inserts uh, called Pedag. And they are, I think you can buy them on Amazon. And they, they do a pretty decent job. You don't, because getting custom shoes, get, getting custom inserts made is very expensive. And the problem is that these shoe inserts don't last long. You have to change them six months to a year. So it's, uh, this is one of the companies that might, uh, this is feedback from patients. Patients like these, this company in particular, but any shoe insert is fine. Um, moving up from feet and ankles to knees, most, uh, so again, instability of the patella, this is the kneecap, and you can see the kneecap can swing from left to right. They really have unstable uh, uh, patella, which makes the knee very unstable, besides the fact that knees are, these knees hyperextend. This is a picture of a hyperextension of the knee. And over here, you can see the left, ankle, the left knee is far more hyperextended than the right knee. And you can see this from here. This is an unstable knee. Well, they're both unstable, but this particular left knee is very, very unstable. And in order to fix this, the first thing is you look at the feet and ankles. Make sure the feet and ankles are all set, then go up to the knee, and then we can talk about knee braces for a minute. This is a technique for uh, kinesiotaping the knee joint. It, it was a paper that was published in 2015. It's there on your slide. You can read it anytime you want. Uh, <clears throat> but kinesiotaping does work very well for this. I've mentioned Thrive Tape. This, they actually have a, uh, I was happy to find that they have a table out there. This is a new company that's come out which really makes these uh, tapes, and I will get into that a little bit later. So what kind of a knee brace should you wear? Uh, the knee brace should have a few things. It should have two straps, straps on the top, straps at the bottom. Remember the foot, the, the, the leg is conical in shape. So having a brace that stays on is a little difficult. So it should have a strap on top, strap at the bottom. It should have a metal strut inside. So this one has a metal strut inside with a, um, with a hinge. And then it should have a donut that keeps the patella in, in the middle without it swinging around from side to side. This particular brace that I have over here is a little difficult to wear because it has some patients have to pull it up. And you know, with, with lax fingers, it's really difficult. Uh, so the compliance on this brace isn't that great. This one is a newer one that came out. It has a really strange name. It's called the gripper. It's kind of a spooky name. Uh, but <laughs> It's not, it doesn't grip your neck, it's just the knee. Uh, so, it, so this, the gripper has the same thing, but it's, it's wraps around. So it's really easy. So the compliance becomes easier. You don't have to spend hours pulling, pulling, tugging, tugging on your brace. It, you wrap it around your knee and then you strap it up and you're all set to go. Um, one of the more common missed causes of pain in the leg uh, is the tibiofibular joint. And I wanted to show you, these patients present with pain on the side of the leg and onto the foot. This is, so it's all on the side of the leg from below the knee, and then it goes down into the foot. <clears throat> this is what happens uh, right below the knee joint. So this is the knee joint, right below that, on the outside of the knee, there's a joint. It's called the proximal tibiofibular joint. So there's a joint between the tibia and the fibula, and this is a joint. And this joint, these two bones, then go down to the leg and become the ankle joint. And what happens is, if they have an instability of the ankle, so a lot of, a lot of patients with EDS, will, what they do is they roll their ankle when they're walking, they roll their ankle. When the ankle rolls, the tibia, the two bones separate. And when they separate, then this nerve over here gets slammed. 
this nerve over here gets pinched. And when this nerve gets pinched, they start to develop pain on the side of their leg, and then they start to drag their feet. So they have a, you'll see, they'll notice that you'll have a, they scrape their feet or else trip on their toes. It happens after they've been walking for some time. And so when you, when you, you'll notice that when you do this, you know, you've been walking, say you walked half a block and all of a sudden you're sort of kind of dragging your foot. And it's most likely because of this. One of the first things to look at is again, ankle instability. So if you're rolling your ankle, you want to fix that first. <clears throat> Now, one of the common things that we find in EDS is tendonitis and bursitis. This bursite, bursas are little pockets of fluid that are everywhere in the body. And then, of course, all the muscles have tendons in them. This is what a normal joint looks like. Uh, there's a bone here, a bone here, and then there's a muscle on top of it that ends in a tendon. All muscles and tendons attach to a joint. They all go over a joint and attach to a bone. And when this muscle contracts, it pulls up this bone. That's the whole purpose. But muscles have to travel over joints. And when they travel over joints, there's a likely chance that they'll get abraded. So what they do is, what we have is a little pocket of fluid between the muscle and the bone. And it's that, that pocket is called a bursa. If for any reason the joint subluxes, so if there's a joint that's moved out in place or the posture, your posture isn't correct, or there's some extra force on, the, I don't know why this, so if there's an extra force on this joint, then the bursa gets inflamed. And what happens is the tendon gets pulled a lot, the tendon gets inflamed also. So the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because treatment for bursitis and tendonitis is not just simply doing a little, putting a little cream on it or doing an injection into it. The treatment lies in correcting what's causing the bursitis and the tendonitis. So it might involve bracing the joint or correcting the posture, avoiding repetitive use of that joint. These are some of the reasons, way to help patients with tendonitis and bursitis. The sacroiliac joint pain is, is, a, is, let me show you. This is the sacroiliac joint pain. So this is the joint in the back. It's part of the pelvis. Uh, generally, these patients have pain in their buttock area. It radiates down the leg, but does not usually go below the knee. It stays above the knee. They may or may not have pain in their groin, and that's usually from SI joint or sacroiliac joint. It's a very common issue in women in general, EDS or no EDS. Um, you want me to? Let me just finish this, and then we'll get to the. Um, now, this is usually because um, because there's there's a leg length discrepancy. So if my left leg has, say, I have a problem in my left leg, my left leg hurts more. And then what I do is I try to protect my left leg. And so I'll tend to walk without pushing, putting too much pressure on my left leg. So when I do that, so for example, if my left leg hurts and I kind of try not to use it too much, so I'm tilted to the side. When you're tilted to one side, then I'm putting more pressure on the SI joint on the right. And that's where the right SI joint starts to hurt. The reason I'm saying this is because that's what helps. This is how we fix SI joint pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, is to figure out what's the reason for be causing this. Is there a leg length discrepancy? Is there something wrong with the feet and legs? <clears throat> and that's, uh, a, it's in, in some severe cases, I do like using a brace for the SI joint. And this is one of the uh, brands that I like using. You have the world's best expert going to talk about dysautonomy and POTS right after this, Dr. Maxwell. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about it and um, in terms of how it affects pain and functioning. So dysautonomy is just a fancy name for a bunch of medical conditions that affect the nerves that control automatic functions in the body. So there's a nervous system in our body called the autonomic nervous system. And if that doesn't behave, we call it dysautonomia. Uh, the most common type that we see in patients with EDS is called POTS. So there are many types of dysautonomias. And one of them is called POTS. This other ones are called orthostatic intolerance and hyperadrenergic POTS and all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> patients with POTS usually present with fainting, dizziness, heart racing, um, headaches. There's difficulty maintaining their body temperature, their brain fog. It's a constant sense of anxiety because their nervous system is revved up. Their flight and fight mechanism is revved up. And when you have your flight and fight mechanism always revved up, 
it looks like you are, or it feels like you are in a state of uh, anxiety, and oftentimes they get misdiagnosed as being in a state of anxiety. Um, it usually happens, one of the reasons it happens is because there's excessive pooling of blood in the lower legs, and then the nervous system has to pump really hard to push it back up to the brain. This is, um, this is um, two websites, the Disarmament International and the Chronic Pain. Actually, Disarmament International has a table out there, and then there's a website called Chronic Pain Partners. They have a lot of information on um, dysautonomia. The thing is that this feeling of dizziness, uh, so always being dizziness gives you this, makes you feel very unsteady, which then puts a strain on the joints and the muscles, and then that makes your muscle pain worse, and which then adds to the fatigue. Pots itself by itself causes fatigue. So I want to talk to you about a little bit about anxiety. It is often overdiagnosed in case of EDS. There are patients with EDS who will say, I mean, there's always some level of anxiety in our lives. There's always some stress in our lives. And especially if you have a medical condition, there's always this sense of anxiety. But this anxiety that I'm talking about is different. It's a sense where you are always a little jumpy. It always feels that there's something underlying and you're take really always on the edge of things. And that's because of POTS. Um, and that, because of this POTS, your nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system is, is an overdrive. And the reason why I said this is because the treatment for this kind of anxiety is different. It's not coming from the brain. It's coming from the body. So in order to help this anxiety, we really have to figure out the POTS. This actually is, a, is an animation by Jill Brooks, and she uh, explains very clearly what POTS is. So if she's upright, then I'm starving. So the brain isn't getting any blood, which means that the heart starts to freak out, and so the heart rate goes up. And that explains POTS in very, very nicely and briefly. Now, but there are other things that can cause POTS besides pooling of blood. And Again, Dr. Maxwell is going to talk about those, but I just want to touch on a few of them. One of them is that there are certain conditions like Sjogren's syndrome, antiphosphorus lipid syndrome, celiac disease. Uh, these conditions can also cause POTS. And the other thing is that the sympathetic nervous system, so the adrenaline that you pump in your blood, is, acts on certain receptors. And if your body develops antibodies towards these receptors, then your sympathetic nervous system isn't going to work well. And these, these are autoimmune conditions where patients develop antibodies to these, these adrenergic receptors. <clears throat> and oftentimes the treatment for that is IVIG infusions. So I'm going to talk about mast cell. Let me go to mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS. Mast cells are cells that live in our body. They are part of the immune system. They're part of our defense mechanism. They are, they're, they're like the National Guard. They don't, they're not doing anything at most times, but when they're called, so when you get an infection or when there's a trigger, then these mast cells get activated. And when they get activated, they start to release chemicals. And I'll show you those chemicals. These chemicals are contained in granules. So mast cells look very granular. They're very large cells. So that's a picture of a red cell. And look at the size of the mast cell. They're huge. And these mast cells contain lots of chemicals. The two or three ones that we need to know are histamine and heparin. Histamine is the one that causes the redness, the itchiness. The, and then heparin is the one that makes our blood um, bleed more. Now, what happens in mast cell activation syndrome is that these mast cells are misbehaving. So they're getting activated inappropriately for some reason. And we need to, and when they get in, activated inappropriately, they release certain chemical mediators like histamines, cytokines. Uh, just to be on the safe side, it's not to be confused with a condition called mastocytosis, which is a whole different, condi different condition. Um, so what do patients with mast cell present with? They present with unexplained rashes, hives. They present with fatigue and tiredness. Muscles hurt, bones hurt, joints hurt, their belly hurts. Um, it makes your POTS worse. So they also have more symptoms of palpitations and dizziness. If you have to explain to someone what, uh, what mast cell is, the easiest way to tell them is that you always feel like you have flu. 
your everything hurts, you feel yucky, you feel tired, you're cold, you just want to curl up in bed and pull your blanket over you. And that's how exactly mast cell activation syndrome feels like. And the problem is that you feel that all the time. Of course, some days are worse than other days. That's dermatographism. So that's one of the classical symptoms of, uh, of, of uh, mast cell. You can actually write on the skin. These, uh, this is, you don't have to remember this slide. It's just wanted to show you the number of chemicals that are released from mast cells. And you can see there are a boatload of these uh, chemicals that are released. There, there are cytokines that are released. Cytokines are like text messages that the brain sends out for pain. So there's a text message that says pain, and then this is a cytokine that's released. Um, and then there are, um, there's histamine, there are enzymes that are released. So there are all kinds of things that are released by these guys. How do you test for ma mast cell? The first thing I need to, you need to know that the testing for mast cell is not reliable. So blood test, urine test, they are not reliable. And the reason I said that is because very often you have symptoms of mast cell. You get diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome, you go to a specialist and then they do a blood test or a urine test and it comes back as normal. And so that ends your treatment right there. But that's not true because there are several reasons why mast cell testing is not reliable. One, it's only positive in about 30% of the cases. And only in 30% of the cases can we catch this test. Um, there's a urine collection, there's blood tests that they can do. Now, the blood test that's done is like, the life of histamine or the life of these enzymes is very, very short. In fact, it's so short that the blood has to be drawn when you're having a flare-up. And when you're having a flare-up, they have to draw the blood, and it has to be put in the refrigerator right away. Like, I'm talking about seconds. It has to be put in seconds. And there are only very few centers in the world that actually test for these chemicals. So you can see how difficult it is to get a lab test done on this. Um, one of the tests that they do is called the serum tryptase levels. Now, serum tryptase level, the problem with that is we don't know what the normal level is. So if you have a serum tryptase level that says four, I don't know if that's high or low. We don't know. But obviously, if you get a serial tryptase levels, then you'll have an idea. All right, it was four last month, and now it's 24, and so it does make sense. Um, so just so you know, for your sake, the diagnosis of mast cell, we depend heavily on clinical exam rather than on lab testing. However, there is one test that you can do. Um, if you've had a biopsy from an endoscopy, like a GI endoscopy or a colonoscopy, and they've already done a biopsy, it can be stained for mast cells. And, and I put down the list of things that can be stained. So firstly, you will have to ask the pathologist very nicely, because insurance doesn't pay them for it, um, is to stain for mast cells using a dye called the CD117. Once they do the dye study, then you have to ask them, like, how many cells, how many mast cells did you see per high power field? Now, there's no number. We don't know what the normal number is. But if it seems like a very high number, if it's only two, it doesn't sound a lot. But if it looks like 200, yeah, then it's, then you're kind of, OK, that sounds very high. Um, and then again, you ask for them that, what does this mast cell look like? Is it, is it like the usual round granular surface, or is it spindle-shaped, or it's got a different deformed shape? Then that, again, gives you an idea about these mast cells. So this is a, a little more reliable test than the blood test and the urine test. <clears throat> the treatment for mast cell is there's in three parts. The first part is to take antihistamines. There are two kinds of antihistamines. There's an H1 histamine blocker and there's an H2 histamine blocker. The H2 histamine blocker is called famotidine. Um, it used to be Zantac, but that's off the market now. Famotidine twice a day. Uh, I like the H1 blocker that I like is clemastine. You can use any, it's Zyrtec, Claritin, Benadryl. All of these are H1 blockers. The reason I like clemastine is because it also helps with pain. So it's one way you can try that. The second part of the treatment is to use mast cell stabilizers. Mast cell stabilizers are, there are three of them. There's quercetin, that thing is read as quercetin, up to 1,000 milligrams a day. It's over the counter. You can buy it over the counter at any pharmacy or Amazon. Uh, ketotiphen is a very, very good mast cell. It's one of my favorites. Um, the third one is called chromolin. And chromolin, uh, it comes both as oral or as a nasal spray or a nebulizer and all kinds of shapes. 
Um, and these are three, these three drugs are mast cell stabilizers. The third part of the treatment is actually the more difficult part. What is it, what is it that's triggering your mast cells? Are there, uh, it's like some of the triggers are taking Motrin, Alevinol. Alcohol can trigger it, opioids can trigger it. Sudden temperature change can trigger it. So if you move from a hot room to a cold room or from a hot shower to a cold bathroom, it can trigger your mast cells. So oftentimes these people have hot flushing after a shower. Inactive ingredients in these drugs can uh, trigger it. Binding agents, preservatives can do it. Um, one of the treatments that also is used is called Singular. It's used for treatment of asthma. You can also get something called a low histamine diet. If you look it up, you'll find it, a low histamine diet. Uh, there are certain vegetables that release more histamine. Um, again, look for other sources for mast cell tr uh, triggers in foods. Gluten is a, is a culprit. Dairy is a culprit. Beef products are culprits also. Now, it does, doesn't apply to everyone. Seasonings is a big culprit. So, and again, all, not everyone. Um, so these are some of the things that you'll have to look at to find like, what is it that's triggering your mast cells in your body? The way I look at it is, there are only two ways you can get a trigger. You can eat it or breathe it. So look at your foods. Is there something in the food that's triggering your mast cells? Look at the air that you're breathing. Is there mold in the house? Is there something in the house? Is there pollen in the house that's triggering it? Old dog poop, old dog vomit, cat stuff, anything, dander, any of that can trigger mast cells. Look for these things. Um, on a flare-up, if you are having a flare-up, Take the histamine blockers, take the mast cell stabilizers, and then you can do a nasal saline wash. That sort of washes out any triggers. A quick note on abdominal pain, belly pain. Uh, belly pain is extremely common in EDS. In fact, one of the initial studies that came out on EDS was from the gastroenterology clinic in the UK. Um, and they have all kinds of issues. They're slowing down on the intestines. They have alternating diet and constipation. Uh, they can present with, uh, so if they have POTS and mast cell activation syndrome, they also have nausea, acid reflux. Prolapse is another one, acid reflux. Now, the low FODMAP diet has, now this, we don't have a great study on this, but most gastroenterologists who treat GI issues in EDS like using the low FODMAP diet. If you Google it, you'll find it. They use it in IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and all. they use that a lot. Um, and this, I have it on my slide over here. It's in three stages. There's a stage one, stage two, and stage three. And you can see that there's a, I even put in a link over there for that. Now, the problem with that is that your intestine has to move food along. And that's kind of a environment inside your abdomen. But if your intestines are not moving food along, if part of the intestine slows down, what happens is bacteria start to grow. And that is called small intestinal bacteria, bacterial overgrowth. The small intestine has 1,000 different types of bacteria. The large intestine has 10,000 different bacteria. And if your intestines aren't moving well, then what happens is these guys in the large intestine, the 10,000 bacteria, start to creep over to the small intestine. And they overpopulate the small intestine. And that is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These patients present with belly pain, they feel bloated, they, this, they produce a lot of gas. Actually, the two gases they produce are hydrogen and methane. So they have bloating, diarrhea, they, they have gassiness. They also have uh, absorption issues like weight loss, vitamin deficiencies, iron deficiencies, low protein. Now, <clears throat> the way they test that is, it's a very simple test. It's a breath test. They have you breathe into this device or breathe into these tubes and they look at the amount of hydrogen and the amount of methane that you're breathing out. And depending on what you're breathing out, the treatment changes. For example, if you're breathing out more methane, then things like the red rice yeast, which has lower statin it, works well for it. Um, for hydrogen and, me and also for methane, they use antibiotics. Uh, there's, there's specific antibiotics for it that they treat. But before you do that, we need to we need to treat the basic problem. Why is your intestine not moving well? We need to get that moving first before you start treating SIBO because if I don't treat the intestinal movement, my SIBO is going to come back no matter what I take. And so, again, treat the constipation, treat the mast cell, treat the uh, POTS, 
Some of the drugs that I like using for GI motility are uh, the ones that I mentioned over here, Resolor, Iborogast. Iborogast is actually over-the-counter, Mastinon, and Erythromycin. Um, again, avoid simple carbohydrates because you don't want, you don't, don't want the sugar producing more gas. Think of pureed foods. This is a condition called median arcuate ligament syndrome. And I don't know for sure how serious this problem is in EDS. We're, it's, it's kind of a brand new condition that we are starting to see or at least diagnose. And I, yesterday when I talked about it, there was a lot of discussion about it, it being very common in EDS. So I think it's something that for you all to know. It's, in brief, it's known as MALS, Median Arcuate Ligament Syndrome. These patients present with belly pain. It's usually, it's usually on the upper abdomen. It's over here in the epigastric region. Uh, it's above the belly button. The pain gets worse when they sit up or stand. It gets better when they lie down, uh, especially on the side. If they lie on their left side or their right side, it gets better. In some cases, it gets better when they lie on their stomach. Um, what happens in this case is that, and this is the picture I want to show you, this is normal. So let's look at the normal first. This is a blood vessel. This is an artery called the celiac artery. And this celiac artery supplies blood to this intestine. So when you eat food, more blood flows to the intestine. There's also a nerve that goes along with it called the celiac plexus. This is a ligament over here called the median arcuate. In MALS, or median arcuate ligament syndrome, this artery, or this ligament, pinches this artery. And that's the part that I don't know why. I don't know why this happens in EDS. And that's why I'm a little confused about this thing. But in any case, it pinches this artery. And so what happens is when you eat food, there's not enough blood flow to the intestine. So they develop pain in their abdomen when they eat food. But it also pinches the nerve that goes to the intestine. So they have nerve pain also. So it's both nerve pain and vascular pain. So it's neurogenic pain as well as vascular pain. Um, one of the tests that they do is they do, the way to diagnose it is that they shoot some dye into your vein and then they look at the supply, what's happening to your, uh, to the blood flow over there. The other one is that they do a nerve block called the celiac plexus nerve block. And when they do a celiac plexus nerve block, you pretty much, your symptoms resolve completely, but temporarily. The eventual treatment is, of, is surgery. And, um, <clears throat> so it's a condition that we are not very sh sure about it, but we're not sure why people with EDS have it, but we do know it exists. <clears throat> but now the other thing is that we're also getting some of this mysterious feedback from patients um, in, the, in the medical literature is patients who had MALS, you treat their males, and some of their other symptoms get better. Their migraines get better, or their neuropathic pain in their leg gets better. And we're just really very not sure we're in the early stages of understanding this disease. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if you're having, look for, think of males. So, you know, they've looked at your GI issues, and the gastroenterologist said there's nothing they found with an endoscopy. Start thinking along these lines. EDS and children, uh, so anybody who, uh, Children who have dislocating joints, uh, chronic body weight pain, bruise easily, have belly pain, fatigue, and have bleeding. Remember, mast cells release heparin. To the emergency room physician, it looks very suspicious of ch child abuse. And that's the part that I worry a lot about. And <clears throat> it's very misunderstood by healthcare providers, as you know. Um, and it's, they're given a diagnosis, a psych diagnosis, very easily by untrained professionals. It's actually the the physician who's lowest on the totem pole, the intern who just graduated yesterday will give you that diagnosis. So for parents, what I recommend is research the facility carefully before taking your child there. Um, they should have trained physicians in EDS who understand this. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is to also check with other patients to get some feedback, what's going on. Um, and if you feel that the physician who's looking at your child is a little skeptical, just quietly walk away. <clears throat> um, talking about service dogs, these are, um, actually this is one of the few conferences where I've not seen a service dog. Service dogs are extremely valuable for, for patients with EDS, especially kids. Um, it, I have, I, I can tell you a dozen kids, uh, a dozen of my 
patients that have gone through college just because they had a service dog. So how does a service dog help? They can sense an attack of dizziness or seizure before it happens. They protect your limb before it happens. They give you a sense of confidence. So they're like, they're like having an, a caregiver always with you. They can call for help. They can open doors. They can pull your wheelchair. Um, just as a word of precaution, peacocks, lizards, and alligators are not service animals. I kid you not. This, is, this has happened where people have shown up with peacocks as service dog animals. Exercises for EDS, um, there will be a talk after that. I just want to give you a quick um, apply, uh, information on that. It's basically about building muscle strength. Don't, no pain, no gain doesn't apply over here. Don't push yourself. Stay under the limits. So if you can do 10 reps, do five reps. After a few weeks, go to six reps. After few, and if you're having a good day, don't do 20 reps. Stay at the six reps. Start really slow and progress very slowly. Focus on muscle strengthening. Avoid joint loading, which means exercise in water. Now, again, in this case, I, if this is the range of motion, so if this knee joint, this is the range of motion from zero degrees to 140 degrees, stay under your range of motion. So that means if I can bring my shoulder up here, stop short. If I can bring my elbow straight out here, stop short. Don't overstretch your joints. And this applies especially to kids because when, they, when they're in sports, they tend to overstretch their joints. So that's the reason why aquatic therapy is very useful is because remember I told you how this, the brain uses contact with skin as a way to figure out your joint position. So the pressure of the water on the body helps your brain understand joint position. And it also takes the weight off so your joints are not, they do, they're not hurt, your muscles can exercise. Swimming is a bad idea. It can affect your neck uh, joints. It can affect your shoulder joints. Thri uh, kinesio taping, I'm going to kind of skip on this because we have a whole lecture on this. Uh, there is a, in fact, I think the vendor is out there. It's called Thrive Tape. This company actually went to the extent of preparing an adhesive that does not react with the skin. They've gone to that extent. So most, that's the problem with most kinesio tapes nowadays is that they react with skin. So this, this one does, I mean, it does, we still have some reports that it does, but in most cases it does not. They have actually developed some, a set of videos for patients with EDS, and you can get them at this website. Um, is that my time up? Five minutes, okay. Um, for those who have a reaction, this is a, this is a 3M product called Cavalon. So you can apply Cavalon, let it dry, and then put the kinesio tape on. That helps. Milk of magnesia helps. So if you put milk of magnesia on the skin and then put the tape on, that helps also. This is a technique of exercise called the Feldenkrais method. Um, this is a very benign technique. It's more on focuses on joint proprioception, joint, and it doesn't. It's not strenuous at all. It's uh, it teaches about correct and safe use of movements in ADS. Um, they are not too many Feldenkrais practitioners around. It's a very difficult process to get certified in it. Um, but there's this one organization that does it online. So you can sign up for it and they walk you through it online. It's called Future Life Now. There's a new drug out there called CGRP, or calcitonin-related gene peptide. This is a chemical that our body produces when there's nerve inflammation and it causes increased blood flow, this leakage of plasma around the nerves, it causes swelling, heat, and redness. Right now, this drug is approved only for treatment of migraines. And this, I think it can help with other pains. And migraines are common in ADS, so I guess if you can try this, and there are three drugs right now in the market, they are expecting to have two more. The three drugs that we have are called Amovig, Ajovi, and Mgality. Um, I think it's worth trying it for if you have migraines, of course, but also it can, it can possibly help other pain conditions. Fatigue is a big deal in ADS. It's, a, it's actually a very difficult condition to treat in uh, ADS. It can happen from uh, multiple reasons. ADS can cause fatigue. POTS can cause fatigue. Mast cell can cause fatigue. Uh, drugs that you use for taking for pain. Pain itself, poor sleep, and secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are, are rechargeable batteries in our body. 
So in most pain conditions or chronic conditions, these rechargeable batteries don't work well. And so if you can, there are, there's, there are drugs, basically over-the-counter drugs, called mitochondrial cocktail that you can take that can actually help these mitochondria function better. Other causes are mouths can do it, SIBO, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, dysfunction of the pituitary can trigger uh, uh, fatigue. And then, of course, sleep, non-restorative sleep that you see in dysautonomia that can cause fatigue. Uh, medicinal marijuana, I just want to really talk. Um, yes, it is worth trying it because one of the reasons, one of the problems is that in EDS, opioids don't work well for some reason. But medical marijuana does work well, so it's worth trying it as long as you stay within the regulatory guidelines. Um, there are two sources of CBD. CBD is the one that people talk a lot about. Um, hemp and marijuana. The problem is that the CBD from marijuana contains 20% CBD, whereas the one from hemp is only 3%. And that's the thing to watch out for. So if you want real CBD, go for the marijuana CBD. Um, it can work. It works really well topically also. It's a reasonable choice to try. Um, one of the things is the problem is that you have to have both. It's something called the, uh, it's, medical marijuana works well if you have both CBD and THC in it. The difference is you can always have a little higher CBD and a little lower THC, uh, but you need to have both in there at, for it to work best. It's something called the entourage effect. So for daytime use, you can have more CBD and less THC, and then for night, you can have more THC and less CBD. Low dose naltrexone, this is, this is actually a disease modifying agent that I really like a lot. Um, it's an old drug that was approved many years ago for the treatment of uh, addiction. Uh, when taken in a small dose between two milligrams to four and a half milligrams, it can help with pain and fatigue. Um, it gives patients a sense of feeling better, their pain is under better control, they're much more active. Uh, it takes time. You have to be on it for weeks to see a difference. I usually recommend a trial of six months. <clears throat> um, the thing, another thing to watch out for is patients with EDS have an abnormal reaction to ED, patients with EDS have an abnormal reaction to medications. They are super. Some patients are super sensitive to it, and so I always recommend starting at a very very low dose and then creeping up slowly, uh, and which is not a bad thing if you're sensitive to it. You just need lower doses. And then you can also get it tested. There's a, something called a pharmacogenomic testing that you can do that can identify what kind of doses you should be using. Acetaminophen uh, or Tylenol is a safe analgesic. It works better when it's taken in conjunction with other drugs. It's like a, almost like a pain booster. NSAIDs are not my favorite. Uh, one, because they can cause uh, increased uh, GI issues and uh, kid affect the kidney, but does help with inflammatory pain. So if your joint is hurting, it's worth trying it. Especially topically, it does work well. Um, opioids do help for those days when are really bad, everything hurts. For short-term use, opioids do work well. But like I said, opioids in EDS don't really work well. Um, Anti-seizure medicines like gabapentin and pregabalin are absolutely useless. They don't work. Uh, no, it's not just me saying it. There's a study, there's a real length study that just came out, uh, and they've said that there's no difference in taking gabapentin. There's only a one-point difference. Antidepressants uh, like tricyclics are good, amitriptyline and all, but SNRIs really don't work well. SSRIs don't help pain at all. This is uh, oxygen supplementation. So there's some, um, there's some anecdotal experience. People who are really fatigued just can't get out of bed and just don't have any functioning. Um, this actually came from, uh, from a French literature is where they took patients and gave them uh, oxygen for 20 minutes twice a day uh, with a nasal thing. And it does, it can help get them more functioning. This is the mitochondrial cocktail I was talking about for mitochondrial dysfunction. Cinemet is a drug that's approved for the treatment of Parkinson's. Um, I found it really, it works really well for muscle spasms and dystonias. It really works very well for that. Start at a low dose. Thank you. <laughs>